Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Oil, Germs, and Iron. Written by Grand Admiral 98. Humanity. What an interesting species. Special at times. Ordinary at times. Ruthless at times. Merciful at times. Its people are moronic, wise, intelligent, stupid, brave, cowardly, honorable, crooked. Much like every other species in the universe. For a long time, people have claimed that it was something with humanity itself. Look at how they conquered the galaxy, people say. Tell me of another race which did that, people argued. But if you would bear with me, ask yourself, did other species not also rise to the same heights? The Yurili invented warp travel 50,000 years before humanity. They could have conquered the galaxy when it was in its infancy. The Jafral, even to this day, holds some of the leading posts in the sciences. The Hologri have the greatest and widest economic network. And the Gulf Order have the largest spy network. And all but one came to the stars long before humanity. And humanity itself is not any more or less special as a species as any of these. So what happened? How did humanity of all the creatures in the cosmos rise to such prominence? To discuss this, we must first begin by describing the thing that pushed humanity over the edge into space travel. Oil and coal. Hydrocarbons of the highest quality found naturally in their soil. This discovery led to their first industrial revolution, which single-handedly propelled the species 2,000 years into their future, accomplishing in two centuries a level of technological competency and curiosity not seen in any species which did not have such a rapid advance. Hardly a reason in itself for their prominence. After all, few species have had such a leap, but those who had an equivalent leap did not conquer the galaxy. The humans did. However, this was not the sole reason for their advancement. It was what happened as a result of this. They were propelled into a region of the galaxy which needed a stabilizing force. The main powers at the time... The Yurili and the Hologri were competing for a slice of this arm. However, it was too far from their home worlds to initiate a war over it. So, tension grew and grew. And lo and behold, a new contestant enters, colonizing space owned by both of them. By the time negotiations came, both of the great powers agreed to let the humans exist, so long as they would give them a part of the resources. In return, they could have an entire contested space. For the great powers, the Cold War had simply changed to a far more manageable front. Human politics instead of planets and stars. This put humanity in an incredibly privileged position, where both of these great powers were throwing resources at it. However, both had misread humanity. Specifically, the amount of power the government had over its citizens. Almost none. A government which gains too much too quickly cannot manage everything after all. And this government had gained billions of stars in a single deal. The powers hoped that this would destabilize the Earth's government enough that they could take control over it. Now, a few of you may be laughing at the last sentence... To explain to our readers who don't know so much about human history, the powers gained full control of Earth's government. It was little more than a puppet. But that government did not have the power, the bureaucracy, the interest, or the capacity to control anything beyond its home system. Which meant that all the good wishes the old powers had gained had been to control space which could only be controlled by human star states local star system governments which barely listened to Earth. Now, you may be thinking, why, after all? The Galaforda also lived in a similar state on the other corner of the galaxy. 
They gained territory, and the central government kept at least some semblance of power. Well, once again, oil. Oil allowed them to advance technologically without the need for centralized their society. Technological advances were accelerated, but societal advances were kept going at the same pace. This means that human society at the 21st century would have been nanotechnology before even post-continental governments. Oil made them unpredictable. But if it were only oil, they would not have gotten much further. The next issue was far more devastating. Humanity had evolved beyond the confines of their world and had earned a place among galactic society, stuck in a cold war. But now there needed to be something more, something which could turn everything around. From the title of this piece, you may have already deduced what it was. Germs. Now other worlds had parasites, viruses, bacteria, and extremophiles, of course. But the cause of the extreme condition of those on Earth were the same as the extinction of the creatures which created their oil. A horrendously changeable climate. These bacteria and parasites could metabolize anything they encountered. Generally, a virus from one species rarely ever damages another it is just one of the facts of life in the universe. Unfortunately, no one told Earth that rule. All life in the universe has some sort of carbon double helix DNA after all, and though the specifics change, it is simply the most capable method of reproduction for complex life. This means that it is possible, in theory, to have a virus which could hop between species Although in practice, this would mean that the virus would have to replicate itself multiple trillions of times with the right conditions and the right contact to do so. Nothing could do so naturally or artificially on any world, besides Earth, that is. The virus itself was the cold, the, by far, most adaptable of human viruses. You may recognize that the name remained unchanged throughout the centuries, what the humans named after a slight increase in their temperature, which causes them to feel cold, became the name for the cold embrace of death that it caused in other species. The effects were devastating. The virus became airborne, making containment almost impossible once on a planet. It was tiny, able to pass through most air filters. It had an incredibly short lifespan, making it exceedingly adaptable. It could lay dormant for weeks, making it almost undetectable. And, most importantly, it had adapted its DNA to attach to any DNA-based life, making it able to jump across species, destroying the cell structure and replacing it with their own. Most species had a 99% fatality rate, including the two main powers at the time. Some had as little as 40%. Still debilitating. Of course, the virus did eventually turn back on the humans, but even the new form only had a 0.01% fatality rate on them, negligible compared to the rest of the galaxy. I will spare you most of the details which you most likely have heard in primary school, but the great cold swept across the galaxy. Before it was even detected, it had already infected 15 Urilli and 23 Hologri planets. By the same time, its scope was revealed that numbers had squared, and it started to infect the smaller races as well. By the time the quarantine was established, well over 5,500 Urilli and 8,000 Hologri worlds had been infected. But it would not stop, because of the airborne nature and the fact that it wasn't immediately identifiable as well as its high ineffectivity and lethality. Millions of ships now unknowingly carried the virus in their crews. Both empires were doomed. None had any natural resistance and no drug, machine or poison could fight it. Some of the smaller species had a high rate of survival, but they were generally few and far between. Humans soon became the go-to person for any job because of their immunity to the disease. 
They became the wealthiest of all the nations, the most powerful, with tendrils in every corporation and government in the galaxy. It was suspected that the humans were responsible, of course, but no one could do anything. They needed people to work the ships and factories, the services left behind after entire worlds were emptied. The Great Cold lasted strongly for thirty years, then quieted down to a lower lethality rate for another one hundred and fifty years, before disappearing. We don't know exactly what happened. Most likely the disease rampaged through the susceptible population at such a pace that only those resistant survived. If you forgive the pun, the cold essentially burnt itself out. But what it left behind was devastating. 90% of the galaxy was dead. 70% of all inhabited worlds were abandoned. Most cities were nothing more than well-kept ruins. A side effect of this were that automation became the new norm in almost every industry, and that new powers would come to be. The Urili could not maintain any semblance of control when they had been reduced from a population of 86 quadrillion to 71 billion. Nor could the Hologrilli, who went from a population of 145 quadrillion to 340 billion. Their empires shoveled away. But in their place, new powers arose. The first amongst these were the Galforda, the spy masters of the galaxy, losing only 70% of their population, the Jafral losing only 50% of their population, and of course, the humans, losing 0.01% of their population. Though this made them the equal of the Gulf Order, of these, the Gulf Order had the largest territory, able to build and maintain it through their incredible use of subterfuge, for which they became known. Second in size, but not in influence, were the humans, with their comparatively spread out population, supplemented with colonial cloning to a population of 60 trillion, with now fully developed worlds from both predecessor powers under their control. The Jeffrel never expanded, but still held a vast influence over the economics of the galaxy. But still, this would have paved the way for a new equilibrium, one where these powers existed. This alone did not give humans the galaxy... There was one last thing. Iron. Two types of iron. That in the core of their planets, making it heavier and with some more massive magnetic field than almost any other world. And the iron in their blood. A product of a rich planet that they evolved from, making them capable of metabolizing oxygen far better than any other species in the galaxy. The first gave them an incredible strength and endurance compared to other species, though this may seem a null point in warfare, primarily located in space. It allowed them to face greater threats in the past, and required far more advanced military tactics than almost any other species. It also allowed the use of boarding parties, which became very effective in the human campaigns, poetically referred to as the War of the Orphans, by the remnants of the old powers, and unpoetically referred to as the Great Human Spanking, by enthusiastic human commanders. The second advantage was the iron in their blood. This means that they metabolized oxygen well enough that they could live almost anywhere. And they did. Every planet they conquered was capable of housing humans and growing their crops. The galaxy was theirs for the taking. In the end, humans were without question the undisputed power in the galaxy, having 80% of it under their direct influence, possessing 70% of its production, of which 40% is human. But this number is growing. 75% of its GDP, 90% of its military, and more. But do remember what was said Humans are not intrinsically better in any way than other species. They have the awesome luck of living on a world which was able to create history's greatest conquerors. We 
are communicating in the human tongue after all. Though, this is the end of my piece. I want you to imagine what the galaxy would have looked like if your world had possessed the same oil, germs, and iron. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click it click with energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I just want to give a quick thanks to the tier 5 patrons and channel members. Alithia, Barky, Fudic Yol, Cam Maxwell, Casper Onholtz, White Band 420, Lord Asrakal, Arcalian, and Oakfield.